Hey everyone. I'm just popping on. And, you know, to be honest, I'm not even sure why I'm popping on right now. Hey everybody. Hey everyone, thanks for um, joining. I mean, I'm hopping on live and I don't even know why I'm hopping on live. Um, because this is just such an embarrassing, shameful, deeply violent, inexcusable moment. And um, it's just really wild to be a person that works in a corrupt institution, which is what Congress is. And to try and be a normal person surrounded by so much decay and moral emptiness that frankly transcends party is very difficult. Um, I was up until five o'clock in the morning last night. I could not sleep thinking about those babies and thinking about those educators and thinking about those families and thinking about not just Texas, but Buffalo and California and Sandy Hook and Tree of Life and First, and First Emmanuel and on and on and on and on. And the thing is, is like, it's not, it's not just gun violence. There's so many different areas and issues where all of us agree, if not all, an overwhelming amount of us agree. And Congress still can't get their shit together. It's really hard and it's super frustrating. And it's frustrating for you. It's frustrating for me being a part of this. And I don't wanna be one of those ding dongs that just tells you to vote harder. Um, because the solution's a lot bigger than that. And it's gonna take a lot more of us and from us to fix this. Um, this isn't just about voting harder. This is about doing a lot more than that. Um, and we have a long ways to go. Um, and it's really important that we understand the roots of this. Um, the vast majority of mass shooters are young men. Um, that have a very troubling history with women. Almost every single time there is violence against women that immediately predates um, the, you know, this violence. This shooter in Texas shot his own grandmother. Um, we've, seen, we've seen a pattern here with this. Um, and you know, when, when it talks about like what can be done short term I mean, are there solutions? Yes. <laughs> we know that there are evidence-based solutions um, that work. Can we get that past the finish line with the political environment? That's the question. And when you have an entire political party that is completely subservient to little daddy NRA, um, that will defend an 18 year old being able, a troubled 18 year old boy to be able to impulse purchase an AR-15 before they're even legally able to purchase a beer. And then you not only have a Republican party that's like that, but then you have, then you have democratic senators who defend them 
and run cover for them, this is a lot more than just voting harder. Um, and it also cuts to the basic structure of our democracy, uh, if you can call it that. Because when you have a presidency that's not determined by a popular vote, when you have a Senate where million, tens of millions of people more can vote for one candidate, one party, rather one party, and still be in the minority, where even in the House of Representatives that's supposed to represent our population, um, that it gets gerrymandered to all hell once in every once every ten years in order to ensure an outsized minority rule and voice in both the House, the Senate, and the presidency. It is becoming increasingly difficult for people to defend the stance that we live in a democracy, in a true one, and what. The real truth of the matter is, is when you look at the fact that our elections are bought, that corporations have and lobbies, powerful corporate lobbies have more say in our legislation than everyday people. We are living in oligarchy that has its democratic moments. We live in an oligarchy that has maybe some democratic areas geographically, maybe some democratic moments, but I mean, we live in a time when the person who's actually supported by more people winning is a rare occasion that is shocking and thrilling uh, when people can beat the power of big money. Being on the right side a lot of the times means that you are on a lonely side that feels small because the power of money, the power of institutions, the power of intergenerational dynastic families can be and often is overwhelming. Um, but that doesn't mean that we give up and I'm not trying to give people some kind of like corny locker room pump up speech, but that is just simply the fact is that hope is an existential question. It is an existential decision because what all of these powers are trying to do is to extinguish the life out of you, whether you are alive or not. They seek to extinguish your hope. They seek to extinguish your faith. They seek to extinguish your desire to fight for a better future. They are doing everything they can to get you to give up. And that's not just the Republican Party. This is the entire power structure of this country. Last night, Democratic leadership went to the mat, to the mat, to defend a, on um, the, the day and day after, in the days after, during and, and all of this stuff. both today and the, I imagine they would continue and yesterday supporting an incumbent that is pro-NRA, anti-choice. They mobilized to deflate a grassroots. They mobilized to try to stop a historic victory candidate I mean, there comes a time when you have to ask if the political leadership in this country is fighting against everyday people or for everyday people. No matter what they say, you have to look at what they do. And um, I have always seen my role 
as just trying to be the small crack of a window, the small crack of a door, the small crack in the dam that lets everyone else through. It's not about anything else. If I, my, my battery's going low, but it's like, you know, if I cared about getting anything else, I would not act the way that I do in Congress. I do this because I feel like everyday people need to have a voice and um, in all of this, but it's hard. It's really hard and um, it's gonna get worse. And I don't like as a leader telling you that, but so long as a party especially a Democratic Party, thinks that there is some level of horror that is going to convince Republicans to change their mind. Like, so long as they're banked on that, like, we're, this is going to keep happening. Um, and when you look at people like Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema, I mean, people aren't stupid, man. Just look at, just look at the FECs look at the reporting, look at the disclosures. It's really not hard to put A and B together. There's a lot of people in here that are not working for you. And um, we need a renewal. People treat Congress like it's some kind of incumbency protection racket. These seats do not belong to us. I've had arguments with people about this, about whether this belongs to us or not, because it doesn't. This is a seat of power that the public entrusts to certain individuals. We're not entitled for it, to it. It doesn't belong to us. We have to earn it. And a lot of the times, you know, a lot of these decisions are made by default and we can't be making them by default. We can't be making them by default. We deserve to have higher standards. We deserve to have higher standards. That's just it. I mean, at this day and age, why are people taking NRA money? Why are people taking corporate money of any, of any kind? Why are we doing that? So, you know, there's of, of course a political issue that we have here, but then there's also a very deep cultural issue that we have. We have the radicalization of young men. This is an issue. Um, young women are not doing this. Young non-binary people are not doing this. Trans people are not doing this. This is an issue that we have. Um, and young men are being radicalized right now in ways that we have not seen. And, um, and we need to talk about that. I mean, and who's managing, who's in charge of all of these platforms <laughs> that are perpetuating this misinformation and violence? Men. Mark Zuckerberg. Where you at, bro? Where you at? 4chan, Reddit. What's up? Because all these little things that they're talking about, when they say free speech, they don't actually mean it. Because they don't they don't protect all speech. They drew do draw a line at some point. But, you know, people like Mark Zuckerberg are busy having dinner with Tucker Carlson, who's also airing little great replacement theories that are inciting violence. And he's platforming the very people that mass shooters are citing in their own very clearly written manifestos. Let us dispense with this myth of mental illness. Okay, after this pandemic, millions of people have struggled with mental illness of some kind, whatever it is, depression, anxiety, bipolar, you know, 
whatever from from mental illnesses that are less presenting to mental illnesses that are more presenting this this is not about that this is about a trained cohesive ideology of hatred and violence whether it is explicit white supremacy that we saw in buffalo or whether it was just simply the silos that young men radicalize themselves in online for whatever reason, using whatever pretenses. And everyone wants to reach for the easy solution. More police in schools does not solve this problem. That is not an opinion. Look at the data. Increasing police officers does not do anything. More money to policing does not do anything. Just if it did, it would have by now. And we have teachers who are not even making a living or a dignified wage, some of whom have sold their blood plasma in order to make things meet, make ends meet. And they are now sacrificing their lives for the chance of possibly saving their students' lives. And where are we talking about putting resources first? Not them, not in healthcare, not anywhere else, but in the place that already has the most resources that have yielded the least amount of change? Come on, just because both parties can agree that that this is something that they love putting more and more money in, no matter how much data tells you that this doesn't do anything, that this doesn't move the needle significantly, because the issues and, and the ability to actually address the root issues is too politically fraught because of what? Because of money? Because we're not willing or ready or capable or mature enough to have honest conversations about race in this country? We are in a deeply violent moment, a deeply violent moment. And it is everywhere and transcends everything. We live in a country that lets people sleep on the street in the middle of winter. We have governments that take the homeless out of trains and throw them on the street to die, many of whom are veterans or actually are ones that are experiencing mental illness. This is a, this is, we live in a society that says if your job doesn't give you health care, you're basically bankrupt for the month or you're just out of luck. I lived years of my life with no health insurance because I couldn't afford it. Just ignoring pains and hoping that I never got sick. That is violence. It's violence, a society that incentivizes charging so much for housing that an entire generation feels like they may never be able to own a home unless their parents gift them some generational wealth. This is a, this is barbarism. This is barbarism. And uh, we are surrounded by violence. The precarity of all of our existence every day. I was walking down the street today after staying up until five o'clock in the morning yesterday thinking about those babies, thinking about those families. And I cross a park and there's all these people in the park people are taking pictures and kids are you know playing on swings and there's elders like playing board games and i i now we think this could all just end right now it's not worth it that precarity, we, we don't, we deserve better. 
everyone deserves better. And there's so many politicians out here that have more words to say defending a goddamn AR-15 and defending the right for radicalized teenagers to impulse buy an impulse purchase an AR-15 and they have more to say defending that than they do have to say about those babies. Then they do have to say about those elders in Buffalo. They do have to say about our Taiwanese brothers and sisters. Or they do have to say about people in Tree of Life or, or First Emmanuel. They have more to say about guns than they have to say about these kids. Why? Because there's a gun lobby that gives them little pieces of paper to read off of. Just copy paste, copy paste. And it's literally what they do. I've noticed that the um, that horrified that horrified and heartbroken is the new thoughts and prayers because these people are just taking money and taking the little talking points and fuck sorry and babies don't have that there's no money in protecting kids is there apparently and it's like you know what like if they actually believed in their positions maybe they would just maybe they just shouldn't take money from the nra to prove that you know there are plenty of entities that i am in agreement with i still don't take money from them because it is important to me to communicate to you all the independence of our positions and that this is something that I believe that we believe without that kind of influence. If they believe this stuff so much, they should stop taking a check from the NRA and see if they keep holding that up. Are you bought or not? Why don't you show up? Why don't you prove it? It's disgusting. And it's prayers, 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 prayers. I say this over again. They're talking about a book that they've never even read because you open up a chapter right there. Faith without works is dead. We don't want to hear it. You don't want to hear it. God don't want to hear it. If that's something you even, if, that, if you happen to ascribe to that. Nobody wants to hear it unless you are capable of doing something about it and are doing something about it, unless you're trying. And these people aren't trying. They are interested in defending themselves and the people that they work for. <sighs> um, I'm just gonna pop into the questions right now because you know I'm sorry if I'm just rambling but this is just it's just unacceptable it's it's messed up this is a country that doesn't pay its teachers that can't invest in schools that refuses to offer universal or guarantee health care you can't even send your, your kid to school thinking that they're gonna be safe. And people are just masquerading on this mythology of American exceptionalism when the whole world is looking at us like, que barbaridad. And it's wild to me the, le the level and the degree of propaganda it's like you want health care you're a communist you want wages you want to be pay paid a decent wage you're a com like there's like literally you you just ascribe to them or like wanting the smallest crumb of dignity in your life makes you some far left radical and it is not republicans just republicans that do that the Democratic Party is also complicit in that. And especially, I'm sorry, especially if you're 
not a man, or if you're black or brown or indigenous, and you happen to want the same modicum of dignity, then you're extra left. Then you're like super far left. It's like there's a paper bag test for how far left you are for having the same damn positions and, and ideals and just, you know, whatever as anybody else. It was so crazy to me. When I got to college, you know, I didn't grow up in, a, in, a, in an ideological household. I grew up in a household that was like, none of these people are working for us. Eyes open, <laughs> navigate swiftly, you know? And, um, and it was so crazy to me that when I got to college, um, people would call me an activist. And I didn't like that at the time. I was like, why are, is everyone calling me an act? Why are people calling me an activist? When I literally just think that my nieces should have the same quality of education as, the, as like two zip codes down. Why does that make me an activist? Like I didn't even feel like that made me an activist. Like it was just like, why? Because, apparent, because in America, that's radical. Because in America, if you want a kid from the South Bronx to have the same quality public education as a kid from Westchester, you're like some far left crazy loon. It's really depressing. And it's like really depressing from my own party. Because it's, it's not just me, it's not a personal thing. It's what they're telling people in communities like that, that you're radical for just like wanting to live. It's a barbarity, it is, a, it is violence. And so, you know, we allow so much. Of course we allow this, right? Of course these systems allow this. They allow everything else. They allow veterans to go homeless. They allow people to go without health care. They, they, they allow diabetes patients to have to choose between rent and insulin. Of course they allow this too. They allow us to boil our planet. But like, hopelessness is not an option. And the thing is, is like, once you get to that point as to why, it's, it's actually very empowering. Because I, you know, I went through that time where I chose that cynicism. It's like, because the thing is, politics is very relational. It involves trust. There's a lot of relationship dynamics that actually apply to our politics, which makes sense because politics are about our macro relationships as a society and with each other. And so it's really easy when government doesn't work for you to say like, screw this, I'm out, I'm opting out, and like, that's it. It's kind of like when you have your heart broken over and over and over and over again, you say that I don't need love in my life. No more. Except we do. And um, by giving into that cynicism, you, you become less human. You turn off a part of your human experience and that's exactly when they got you where you want to because you will accept anything. And we're not gonna accept it. We're not. And, it, you know, it's not just about voting harder. There's so many things we can do. There's so many things we can do on a local level, on a community level. There's direct action that's possible. There's tons of stuff at our fingertips. And it's just about getting creative. And it starts in one place. It just starts in one place. Whether it's a bunch of teachers doing a sick out or parents doing a sick out. I mean, wherever it starts, it starts, but it never starts on a big level and then goes down. 
it almost always starts with a small group or one community that decides to take a creative action that works for them. And it works on a small level and it inspires others and they do it and then they do it and then they do it and then they do it. And so right now is just the moment to try anything. You got an idea? Try it. Because you got, because like Joe Manchin's not going to save us. That's for sure. Um, this system on its own is not designed to save or protect us. It is desi designed to defend the powerful. It's designed to defend concentrated money. It's designed to defend undemocratic institutions. It's, de it's designed to defend the just all of it. I mean, the thing that like this, the, the country was founded on oligarchical principles. It, it was, it wasn't just, it wasn't just white men. It was wealthy white men. Like a very, like that, it's not a democracy. It's like a democracy. It's, it, we're talking about overarching oligarchy with some democratic moments. And we have to expand the structures that actually make government accountable to us. It can happen on a city level. It can happen on a community level. It can happen on a state level. But we have a lot to contend with because these disinformation machines are really something. And that's what we're contending against. And I wish I had easy answers. I wish I did. I don't. And even hopping on here, I'm like, even I sometimes, I'm like, what's the point, right? I don't have a solution to give you all. Um, HR8 passed the House. The House of Representatives has passed several bills relating to gun safety and they just are sitting in the Senate. So the good news, at least politically and just procedurally, is that, you know, you've got two thirds. We don't have the Senate. Um, but the Senate is not designed for the people to hold. Um, but, you know, there's just so much that we can do. Uh, someone says, elaborate a little bit on these bills. So I would look up HR8. HR8 is, um, just so you all know, the House of Representatives, every term, the when you get a bill number, it can be like HR26100, HR2652, you know, where you get all these random numbers. HR1 through 10 is designed uh, there, those numbers are reserved for the speaker and those indicate the top 10 priorities of, um, of the party of that is, uh, the majority in the house. And it is the priority bills for that Congress. HR one has to do with getting money out of politics. Uh, and there are many, many, many provisions inside HR eight has to do with gun safety. And there's a lot in HR8. Um, and there are debates over different provisions. You know, there may be, you know, people may have debates about universal background checks, how effective they are, et cetera. But ultimately, if you look up, for example, advocacy groups like Every Town for Gun Safety or uh, March for Our Lives, there are full legislative platforms there. And some of them are really so basic and when you look at some of these things you're like how does this not even how have we not passed this yet there are some people that should not have firearms in the united states maybe we should have waiting periods 
Maybe we should assess what kind of guns are up for purchase. There are so many things that we can try. There are several things that have been passed, but at the end of the day, you have two Democratic senators that just don't believe in governance. I mean, you literally had Senator Kirsten Sinema that says she doesn't believe that DC is gonna have a solution to this. Girl, what? This is literally what we're sent here to do. And um, there's just far too many people that are like proxying their job. Like instead of thinking problem, solution, they're thinking problem, election this, or they're thinking problem, money that, problem, ambition this. We can't come to a solution. There is no solution. No, that's not what we're sent here to do. We're sent here for problem and solution. Um, and, you know, someone said, I love your, your point here um, about starting small. And like, that's the thing that I think is so important is that it is about starting small. And like when, we're, when you're in the frame, when you're of the mind of thinking only like super big, and it's important to think big, but if you're only thinking on a macro level, it's go of course it's gonna feel impossible. Of course it's gonna feel impossible. But there are things that you can do in your immediate community. Literally try anything, anything. <laughs> um, there are local safety communities. I mean, there are communities where elders are, you're basically, you know, your neighborhood watch and they go out on the porch and they keep an eye out and eyes make communities safer. Feeling seen makes communities safer. We know this even from city planning and design. And so there are no actions that are too small. There are no actions that are too naive. You know, at, at the beginning of the year when Omicron was really starting to swing up, there was a high school, I think it might've been Brooklyn Tech, but correct me if I'm wrong, that organized a walkout and they were like, and it was the students that organized a walkout and they were like, this is ridiculous. Like someone's testing positive every other period, like teachers are going in and out. My life is so unstable. Like I, and they did a walkout. And it was literally forcing the city to reevaluate its approach. And the only reason that it didn't, I think one of the only reasons that it didn't like fully kind of come out is because the, the wave had plummeted just in time. But don't underestimate the power of small groups of people small groups of people it like it literally when my campaign for congress started off with me in little living rooms of people in my district just don't underestimate how much power you have in your community we're working on this issue nationally um and it's tough and you should continue to stay engaged and you should continue to look at who's elected to represent you. But also we need to build a bench. And there's, it could be local elected leaders. You could not even be involved in electoral organizing at all. You can organize around your school. I mean, literally it gets to the point where we're seeing so many of, so many young men radicalized to violence. It's like, even just at this point, even just especially if you're in high school or if you're in your 20s, but really all over the place, just keeping an eye out on your friends. If you see them, you know, just starting to fall down these rabbit holes, it's just when they're starting to fall down these rabbit holes that you can most quickly get a hold of them again. 
And uh, even that is really effective. Um, and you know, someone said not young men, young white men. I think this is something important to talk about because we're seeing that in instances of mass shootings, you know, this that there is a racial, you know, component in some of these, but it's actually a lot of young men, period. It's just that the mass shootings that happen in our communities don't get covered as much. In Brownsville, Brooklyn, in the South Bronx, it, it, it's these are these are shootings where many people are impacted and they're treated as as different but this is a crisis of young men it manifests in different ways but we need mentorship we need our our strong male like healthy male role models like out there mentoring our young men we really need it because if our healthy strong role models aren't aren't having those relationships and I mean, I get it. We live also in a capitalistic society that breeds isolation. And if you, and if it, unless it's like your own family member, your own nephew or your own child, it's like, how am I supposed to have that relationship if you're not a teacher or in some type of position like that? But we gotta figure it out. Straight up, like whether it's big brothers, big sisters, whether it's just like literally walking around your block, like, we need connection and isolation, especially after these last two years, but you know, it continues, is a huge part of this equation. It's part of the larger equation of radicalization of all kinds. Um, and uh, you know, like check on the men in your life, seriously. Um, because there's, it just feels like there's very few like role models and examples of people talking about this in healthy ways. And it's a big problem because there are a lot of crises. Um, and especially as we try to evolve out of a world that is predatory on women, gay, non-binary, and trans people because traditional regressive, you know, patriarchal values really create men's identity in relation, uh, create like men's identity and uplift men's identity in relation to other things in relation to like how women treat them, how much stuff they have, etc. And when for a very long period of time, we have been taught that trans and non-binary and, and women are less than, as they say, in oppressive societies, equality feels like oppression. And so I think there, you know, there are a lot of structures that are having identity crises right now because there are there there is progress towards equality. But there is such a thing as healthy masculinity that is not rooted in the subjugation of other people and that other people's full personhood does not detract from that. But we need good examples of that because a lot there's just a lot of trash examples out there and they are just acting like predators on young men out here and it's precipitating a lot of this so you know there's a lot of work that needs to be done um and uh it's very deep that's why it's not as simple as an election. This is cultural, this is historical. Um, and the thing is, is that the muscle memory is, the muscle memory for this country is for white supremacy. It has a muscle memory for patriarchy. It has a muscle memory for hate. And so to choose a different path is to form a new muscle. 
Is it harder? Yeah. Is it worth it? Also, yeah. So, you know, that's what we're up to doing. Um, I'll post on my IG stories uh, some of the legislative points um, for you all to take a look at. Um, and what, and I'll, I'll show you HR8, which has already passed, which we already passed the house. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll throw that up on the stories. I'm sorry I don't have it right here in front of me. I don't wanna misrepresent um, the, the details of the legislation and I just have my phone and I can't share the screen with something else. Um, but I will make an IG story going further into depth about HR8 and some of, um, and you know, some of the, the details of that. Um, you know, someone says, okay, why do you spread you know, it's funny, it's like, I, I find it really interesting that people think that like spreading and discussing realities and how we heal from our country's wounds as spreading hate, when really what it is is like they don't wanna be reminded of the hate that exists. And if we aren't willing to confront it, it's just gonna keep growing. Talking about it is not feeding it, it's not inciting it. White supremacy is a fact. It's not just a fact. You look at FBI statistics, which underreport hate crimes, police statistics, which also underreport, even all the institutions that underreport hate crimes still has white supremacist groups as by far by far the leading uh, driving, the leading driver of domestic terrorism in the United States. And that's with all the generosity that they get from underreporting. It's not even close. It's like the bar of white supremacist violence is like this. And then it's like all the other categories are like that. Um, and so it's not inciting anything to talk about that. There's no what ifs here. There's no like, what about Antifa here? Like, look at the numbers and accept all of us, accept responsibility for the reality. It's a reality for a reason because we keep ignoring the issue and beating around the bush. And that's why it's, it's gonna take all of us. It's gonna take all of us because the way that a lot of people get de-radicalized is the most effective way is by someone that they personally know. Someone in their job, someone in their family, someone in their school. I'm not gonna de-radicalize a lot of people. I know that because media is a funhouse mirror because cable news is a funhouse mirror. If not a magnifying glass that tries to like take the laser and fry the ant like that is the role of a lot of news and television i'm not going to change a lot of people's minds no one on tv is going to change a lot of people's minds you can change your co-workers mind in little tiny conversations and it doesn't happen in one day never happens in one day you just pepper a question here pepper a question there Give someone space and over time, you can bring someone back from the brink, but it has to be relational. It has to be from someone that they know. And um, that's, that's, that is why the small stuff is so important. That's why the small stuff is so important. those small conversations, those small moments, they really matter. Because once your mind is made up, you're not listening to anybody on TV. You're not really looking at much stuff anywhere else. You, you choose the media that you consume. It is through relationship and dismantling isolation that we're gonna be able to come together, but it is in the micro. It's the micro that's really gonna change this thing. 
gets reflected in the macro. And again, I'm not telling you to stop. I'm not telling you not to vote. I'm not telling you to disengage. I'm not telling you none of that stuff. What I am talking about is being mindful and making this part, an imbued part of your life. Whether it's having a conversation with someone, whether it's, you know, when you walk outside your apartment, like here in New York City, and you see, and if you're, you know, if you're like a guy my age, you see some kids playing out in the street, you see some boys playing out in the street, just keeping an eye on them, letting them know that there's a neighbor out there that gives a damn about them. Because there's, because it's a profoundly isolating feeling to feel like no one cares about you. And if your mom and your dad aren't there, you feel like no one cares about you. So sometimes if you just walk outside your house, you know, every time you come out for work or come back from work and you see some kids just hanging out there, just saying hello every day, those small moments, small repeated moments matter. And um, we're doing we, we're doing everything, you know, for what it's worth, the house is done. The house has done work. This isn't about the house hasn't passed anything. The house has passed plenty. The Senate is not passing anything. And we have to, you know, boost our organizing. But I will tell you as a member of the U.S. House of Representatives, we have done work. We've done work on this. Lucy McBath out in Georgia lost her son to this. This is her life's work. She leads on this issue. We've, and we voted on it and we've passed it. And Joe Manchin, you know, has just more of an affinity for the filibuster than almost anything else. Um, and that's a political problem that we're gonna have to uh, navigate and confront and, and figure things out about. But in the meantime, this is not either or, this is all of the above. This is an all hands on deck approach. So anyways, much love to you all. I'm sorry, I wish I had, I, I wish there was just, you know, I wish this was easy. But if it was easy, you know, maybe we wouldn't even be doing it right now, but um, we're gonna keep doing everything we, we can. On the official side, I have a town hall. Uh, if you live in my district, um, I have a town hall tomorrow. I'll be able to I'll be able to dive a little bit more deeply into that. Um, you can hop in online as well. Just go to my official handle at Rep AOC. That's R E P A O C to get the details on that. Um, but just wanted to. I mean, I'm not trying to give anything. Honestly, I'm trying to share space with you all um, because I think we all just need to grieve and stay mad. Because the moment they take your rage from you also add injustice. I mean, it's appropriate. It's, impro it's appropriate to feel rage and injustice. And the, mo the moment they take that away from you um, is the moment they get you to acquiesce. And we will not acquiesce. We reject dystopia till the end. All right. Thank you all. Bye-bye.